West of Africa, at least four people have been killed in clashes in Ivory Coast as hundreds took to the streets following President Alassa Ouattara's decision to run for a third term this October. Three people were killed in the central town of Dalkro in clashes between Ouattara supporters and backers of rival candidates Henry Conan Beatty, a security source and witness said. Despite the violence, Ouattara's uh, Rally for Democracy and Peace Party announced he would be formally nominated as its candidate at a big rally in Abidjan on August the 22nd. Otara, who is 78, announced a week ago he would contest the October 31st presidential elections, a move that came after his anointed successor, Prime Minister Amadou Koulibaly, died of a heart attack. The announcement sparked fury among Watara's critics as he has already served two terms and can only contest a third by arguing that a constitutional change entitles him to reset the clock. And joining us live is David Hondey, who is a writer, journalist, and broadcaster to make sense of all of this conversation. Good to have you, David. Thanks for having me. Now, I mean, let's begin. How do you judge leadership in Africa generally. When it is time for leaders to move on, they begin to think of resetting the clock. What do you say? First of all, I think um, the institution of the head of state in Africa is, uh, there's too much power concentrated in it. Mm -hmm. And this, this isn't just a problem in Ivory Coast, this is a problem even here in Nigeria, this is a problem across right. pretty much all of Africa. It's, 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 it's a similar issue. I think the only exception would be the Southern African community, with the exception of Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. but they seem to be stable. But generally, I get the impression that historically, Africa was Af Africa was never a place where uh, large groups of huge groups of people existed uh, homogeneously under a single head of state kind of individual. Africa was always a very federal entity, mm -hmm. but uh, the post-colonial African states. The, you know, the borders that have been sort of externally imposed on Africa have made it such that you now have 100 million people, 50 million people who historically did not really have that much in common, right. smushed together under one person and that almost inevitably creates this, the circumstances for one individual who is the head of state to become a dictator because that seems to be only, the only way to enforce their will. Mm. on these African countries. Right. I mean, we, we also read about the uh, president of Senegal, uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, also vying for third term, and it barely raised any dust. You know, why is it? Is it, are we becoming comfortable to say, well, um, that's what is going to happen. Even if we try, there's not going to be any difference. I think there's definitely an element of that. I think where, particularly the African press, has become a bit jaded. Because we hear this is not the first, second, third, fourth, fifth time we hear this is a regular thing. Uh, Watara's predecessor, Lauren Bagbo, mm -hmm. literally had French military tanks in the capital and they had to storm the presidential palace before he gave up power. So this is just plus a challenge, it's more of the same. Um, in Watara, what the other element in this particular in instance is that I believe that there's an, there's an element of embarrassment hmm. from the French establishment who obviously backed Ouattara's entry Correct. because Lauren Babo was the sit-tight leader and now their man has also become a sit-tight leader and as we know uh, the, the, the Ivory Coast is one of the most strategic countries in West Africa for mm -hmm. French political and economic interests so I, I believe there's an element of state embarrassment for them that the man they've put in is doing the same thing and also that uh, they seem to have no problem with doing business mm. or, or maintaining cordial relationships with someone who, to all intents and purposes, is the exact same thing as the person that they ousted. Right. Now, l let's move forward a bit. There's been protests. The people are saying, okay, we're not going to allow this to happen. In your opinion, do you think that even the protest is going to change anything? Um, yes and no. Yes, in the <laughs> sense that... Uh, Obviously, there's always there's always an effect that uh, the pro uh, having a process at the right scale can have. But no, in the sense that the very peculiar history, particularly the recent history of Ivory Coast over the past decade, mm -hmm. has made it such that without uh, French backing for a popular revolution, it's almost certain to fail. The Ivory Coast has put itself in a situation where it's unable to sort out its own internal problems, its former colonial uh, administrator always has to step in to sort out these problems for it. So uh, when uh, Lauren Bagbo lost the last election, 
there was no capacity within the country to force a sit tight dictator who had lost the election to leave. Mm. And they had, so we had this very surreal imagery then of French commandos in Abidjan, you know, and in Yamoussoukro, mm. you know, marching through the city and storming the presidential palace, which from an, from an African point of view, I think was a huge embarrassment. Right. But also internally gave the people the idea that, well, if France says this, this is what happens. And if not, you know, and I think that's the very unfortunate situation that the Ivory Coast finds itself mm, in. I completely agree with you. And then let's talk about solution. What sort of reform should, um, you know, Africa get? You know, to change the narrative completely, because I mean, you've mentioned more than twice how this is a national you know, embarrassment for the people, but by extension, for the African continent as well, it's always an embarrassment you know, to be in that situation. What sort of reform should we be looking at to be able to change our story, if you like? So it's twofold. Um, first of all, the, I believe there's already something called the peer review mechanism at the AU, which somehow seeks to benchmark uh, the performance and political stability of African governments against each other. Now, I don't believe this institution is strong enough, but if there can be sufficient political cooperation, which obviously is a big ask across the AU, mm -hmm. there might be something uh, to go for that. More importantly, I think uh, economic integration through the AFCFTA is what will haste, is the economic revolution, if you will, comes before the political one. I believe, um, the reason these sit tight dictators and the dictatorships around them, because a dictator isn't just one person, we have to always remember. Mm. The reason they, the, Afri the African post colonial states find it so easy to incubate a dictatorship is because the, the, uh, the economic system makes it such that the government is the wealthiest entity in the country. The government has too much economic power. Now, if we're able to decentralize that power through the AFC, FTA, put more money in ordinary people's pockets, then that in itself will precipitate the conditions for a political revolution. Because currently, where there's too much poverty, mm. somebody that has some $50 is always the king. So if you can make it such that the AFC, FTA, we actually implement it, and not the half-hearted implementation that we've been struggling with for years now, mm -hmm. and that uh, increases the rate of intra-African trade, because Africa, is, Africa has the world's lowest rate of intra-regional trade, if you can double or triple that in a decade, I think that necessarily will precipitate a political mm -hmm. revolution. I mean, just uh, to add, to ask uh, what you had just said, talking about poverty, you know, the role that poverty uh, plays. I don't know what you think, but, you know, some have argued that um, a benevolent dictator who can stay with extended tenure is better than, you know, the regularly imposed uh, power must change had, uh, that, you know, strategy that we see. What do you think about that? Well, first of all, the term uh, benevolent dictator is an oxymoron. There's no such thing. There's dictators who are fully manifested mm -hmm. and there's those who haven't yet. There's no such thing as a benevolent dictator. The, my ultimate example of the sit tight dictator who was perceived as benevolent externally who, when he left, or when he was forced out, we then saw the real state of the country was Muammar Gaddafi. Right. He was in power for 42 years. And under him, Libya appeared to be you know, this African utopia. But as we mm. saw when he left, Libya was actually a deeply divided country. And he actually ruled the country as his personal fiefdom. And as we have seen since, the problem, the basic problem with a dictatorship in an African state is that it's built around the personality of one person, of one right. man. When that person leaves, mm -hmm. the state inevitably will fall into chaos. So regardless of whatever progress you think you're making under a dictatorship, that progress is always temporary. It's always going to degenerate into a civil war after the dictator leaves. So no matter how messy the democratic process might seem, it's necessary. It's not a nice to have. It's something you have to have if you need, if you want sustainable progress. Mm. Where do we strike the balance in all of this? Balance between? For all the best leadership in Africa, in our, our structure of government in Africa as a whole, where do we get that place where, you know, where they say uh, a virtue stands in the middle? Where is the virtue? I think, uh, quoting Prof. John Aite, the Ghanaian professor who is, who, is, who is a regular speaker on this issue, I believe we need to borrow a leaf from how some of our pre-colonial African societies used to run to an extent. Now, obviously, they were not the most democratic societies on earth, but they had some very important elements like uh, proportional representation. Everybody was represented. So unlike this presidential system we've adopted across the continent where one man's word is mm -hmm. almost oh. like a law, almost like a decree. I think we need to have a, a much more parliamentary system where, again, as I said, it's quite it's a messy process. It's not pretty. There's a lot of horse trading involved. But instead of having 
that much power centralized into one person and one office, which creates the opportunity for chaos. Mm -hmm. Diffuse that power as much as possible and let everything happen by consensus, which obviously will mean that progress will be slower, but it will also mean that every progress you make is going to be sustained because mm -hmm. everyone did it collectively. Right, and now talking about everyone doing it collectively, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, we always hear, and people always say that power belongs to the people, you know, you own the power. What role will the people play in this? How do we rise to the place where we actually believe and claim, lay a claim on that statement that power belongs to us, that the people, you know, own the power? I think one of the most important things we can do is, first of all, to educate ourselves mm. about the political system of the country that we live in, understand that uh, a democracy is not just, the word democracy doesn't mean elections. Right. Democracy means government of the people by people for the people. There are several levels. Well, it has become a cliche that we also don't even internalize or believe. It's more like a saying. Do we leave that out? Yeah, so which ties in against what I'm saying, that the fact that you have a government which at least in form, at least the way it appears is democratic, even mm. if it isn't that in practice. But the fact that those institutions exist, even if they are weak, means that there's still an opportunity. So as long as enough people, the critical mass of people, insist on engaging with that democratic system, except the government wants to actively come out and say, you know what, we're not democratic anymore, we're pointing a gun in everyone's face. With the exception of that, that will force the government to listen to them. Because ultimately, even in the you know, the countries you think of as the out and out dictatorships in Africa, you know, the Uganda and them lot. If the, at some point enough people still stand up to demand for certain things, those things still happen because mm. a dictator is not superhuman, still needs the approval or at least the nonchalance of a certain critical mass of the populace. All right. Thank you so very much, David, for bringing your insights and contributions into the matter. Thanks for having me. And the breakfast, shows, breakfast show rather, continues shortly after this break. Be with us.